Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 2020 summer forum entitled State Budget in Crisis. My name is Denise Williams, and I am the Chief Program Officer for Silicon Valley Education Foundation. Just for a minute, not even a minute, there's going to be a little survey that's going to pop up on your screen. And please take a couple seconds just to complete that, if you would please. And that helps us to monitor our uh, participants. And feel free as we go through this uh, event to put questions in the chat during the discussions. And that's how we'll be able to uh, address those uh, at the question and answering at the end. At this time, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel. Our first superintendent that's on the panel is Jose Monzo. He has served as superintendent of the Oak Grove School District in San Jose since 2012. Dr. Robert Bravo has 28 years of experience in education and has served as the superintendent of Campbell Union High School District since 2016. Dr. Wesley Smith is the executive director, Association of California School Administrators, also known as AXA. Dennis Meyer, Assistant Executive Director, California School Board Association. Dr. Marianne Dewan is our County Superintendent of Schools. She will not be participating on the panel, but she is a very important piece of this work that we're doing today. And I will introduce her when she brings closure to our entire um, event at the end. And we're very happy that she has, out of her busy schedule, been able to participate with us. And Toby Boyd, also on the panel, president of California Teacher Association, and also, first and foremost, a kindergarten teacher in Elk Grove Unified School District. So now we have our very own, oh, one quick thing. Just, I had I already said that this was, of course, the Silicon Valley Education Foundation event. Just want to say for those who you, of you that do not know, it is a nonprofit leader in providing strategic solutions through collective impact. Silicon Valley Ed Foundation has an established legacy of providing pro proven STEM programs and being profoundly committed to empowering students to graduate high school career and college ready. And with that, the person who leads all of this work is CEO, Dr. Lisa Andrew. And Dr. Lisa Andrew is going to be the moderator for the panel. She has deep experience as both a nonprofit and public school leader, including superintendent of Hollister School District and regional executive director of Partners in School Innovation. She has held positions in education ranging from teacher to technology, coach to college professor, to director in the educational services branch of the Santa Clara County Office of Education. A strong advocate for excellent instruction for all students. Please join me in welcoming our monitor for this morning, Dr. Lisa Andrew. Well, good morning and thank you, Denise. I am delighted to be with you today and moderating our courageous educational leaders. I say courageous as I think you would agree that the state of today's educational environment is unsettled, unpredictable, and unnerving. While COVID-19 has brought a new set of circumstances for educational systems to solve and pay for, educational leaders are no stranger to solving for budgetary shortfalls and cuts. In a recent school financing report published by Education Weekly, did you know that California received a C plus in school financing? 
The story is worse when graded for spending, where California received a D. But most disturbing, but not surprising, is California's grade of A minus for distributing the money equally throughout the state. Will you say an A minus? That's a great mark. But an A minus in this category means California does not allocate based on need. It does not allocate equitably. Currently in East San Jose, the East San Jose High School District receives between 11 to $13,000 per student of public funding. Comparatively, districts in more well-resourced areas of Silicon Valley yield greater revenue through higher property taxes in addition to private foundation arms at funding rates between 16 and $24,000 per student. That is a massive difference. On February 13th, 2019, Governor Newsom stated, California is still 41st in the nation in per pupil funding. Something needs to change. We need to have an honest conversation about how we fund our schools at a state and local level. Well, here we are one year later, having that honest conversation, discussing strategies to, once again, solve for the governor's proposed budget, proposed cuts to K-12 education. You know, the bottom line is that school districts in California have not been appropriately funded for a very long time, if ever. California ranked 25th prior to the 2008 economic downturn and 41st pre-COVID. So this is not something that COVID-19 is causing. So good morning to our panel and thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. We have a few questions to gain a better perspective on current issues. I do wanna give you a reminder to keep your responses to about two minutes so that we can hear as much as possible. So let's begin with the organizations that support our school districts. Let's start with the Association of California School Administrators the California School Board Association, and the California Teachers Association. Wes, we're gonna ask you to kick us off. What part of the state budget reductions pertaining to education are especially troubling for the Association of California School Administrators? Thanks, Dr. Andrew, for that great question and thanks for this invite. Um, let, let me first say thank you to the Silicon Valley Ed Foundation. I've worked with them before, the work they do is amazing for some of the neediest students in that community, and I would say our state. To Manny, who's on this call, the Dean of Superintendents in Region A, and, and Lisa Andrew is a fierce equity <laughs> warrior. And I would suggest right now, maybe more than ever, that's the kind of leadership we need in this state and in this nation. So thank you, and to the panelists who are amazing. Um, I, I did wanna say before I, I, I answer that specific question, you mentioned some great data. The one thing I think we have to also understand is while all that's true, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. So it is not a resource gap that we're facing in California, it's a priority gap. We don't prioritize per student funding. And, and folks can say, and they often do, well, what should we do, Wes, or other people on the phone? And I think it's a bit offensive. We weren't elected to allocate resources in that state. That's the governor, that's the legislature, that's the Department of Finance. But for what it's worth, uh, closing tax loopholes, doing away with pet projects like high-speed rail and other things, and putting those resources in education is a heck of a start. Um, mm -hmm. Lisa, to, to your question though, and, and everyone from the association could answer the same, so I'll only, I'll only hit one thing. I think the biggest concern for our members is the 10% cut to LCFF. Uh, the base is the most important part. It drives concentration and supplemental factors and other things. We need to take all of our resources and put them into the base. Um, there are other great things. Um, certainly uh, administrator training is important and teacher housing is important. But in a crisis, for us, the most important thing is invest in the base. We need a full uh, and even additional investment in LCFF, because guess what? Educating in a COVID reality is more expensive, not less expensive. And I know we're to get into that today. So uh, to stay under my two minutes, LCFF and the cut there, that 10%, $6.5 billion, we cannot suffer that, nor should we have to. Great, thanks, Wes. Toby, we know that teachers are the cornerstone of student achievement, thus the future of our economy. 
So what part of these state budget rejections pertaining to education are especially troubling for the California Teachers Association? Um, Lisa, thank you very much for the question. And I, it, it's great following a, um, a person that I admire a lot, Wes, and what he stated, I could just say ditto and just stop. But you know, <laughs> given a platform to talk, I'll never do that. Good, good. Uh, um, but the cuts are very uh, devastating to education. If they go through the way that they're stated, and I know that the, the Assembly and the Senate has come through and given their version of what it's gonna look like, but any cuts to education cannot happen, especially if we want to start back this, this economy the way it should be in order to get us moving forward. I couldn't agree with West, fifth largest economy. We are not a priority in this state. However, it's a national problem because we are not a priority to educate our youth. We spend more time and more efforts, it seems like, in um, detaining and convicting and imprison imprisoning folks than we do in educating the youth in order for them to make a difference and make a good choice. So the cuts, if they occur, we're looking at, you know, 57,000 educators being lost, 125,000 educating support people being lost, and they expect us to restart school in a post-COVID-19 or in a COVID-19 situation because of, you know, newsflash, COVID-19 is gonna be here for a while, folks. And so we're gonna have to look at this as our new reality and how do we effectively teach our youth the way that we need to if we're going to be experiencing those cuts. So they want us to open safely, the cuts will not allow us to do so. And I'll just stop there. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So Dennis, I am sure there have been many conversations at the California School Board Association about the proposed budget. So what part of the state budget reductions pertaining to education are especially troubling for you? Thanks, Lisa. And again, you know, thanks to the foundation for having this forum and for the invitation. Um, so just like Toby said, I could stop at ditto, but hey, I'm a lobbyist, so I can't stop talking. But, um, you know, dialing back to pre-March, mm -hmm. uh, we had the January budget that, um, this is January budget, so this is not May revision. This is January budget, which was fund LCFF uh, with a cost of living adjustment. And we thought that was a pretty decent budget. There were some uh, arguments starting to form about uh, some one-time money and, and whether or not uh, there were better purposes for that. But even under that scenario, we uh, surveyed districts. And, and here's the thing is the, you know, the COLA back then was like 2.29%. Now it's 2.31. But even in that scenario, districts were looking at their costs year to year at about 4%. So even in a scenario where it was a fairly decent budget, there were going to have to be some adjustments moving into this next fiscal year and then COVID-19. Um, so as districts then switched to uh, distance learning and, and all the teacher training and getting devices out to kids and all that stuff going on, there's their costs increased three, four, five hundred bucks per student. Then the conversation started going to reopening, and then we saw the May revision, which had the 10% cut in it. So it's it's all disturbing because as you said, Lisa, at the beginning, we we've kind of gone away from the conversation about what the schools need to do the job that they're expected to do. So that's why we've been working with AXA and others on full and fair funding. Yeah. Uh, we we proposed a ballot measure that that won't be you won't see it in 2020 but uh, potentially in 2022 that raises about $2,400 per student. I mean it's it's serious money to actually move the needle and close achievement gaps. Uh, we know schools and communities first is going to be on the November ballot, which is you know as much as $700 per student. Those are conversations that we're not having right now because we're thinking about how do we reopen schools safely with distance learning with the adequate uh, personal protective equipment how do you run school buses in a distance in a in a social distancing world how do you provide meals all of that's going to cost more yet from the state we're seeing either the may revision which is a 10 percent cut or the legislative version which is a cost of living increase relying more on deferrals and relying on on federal money coming so yeah. 
that's the concern is how do you reopen safely when you're not getting four or five hundred dollars more per student that you're going to need to do it safely so that's i can't wait to hear the superintendent's talk because they're at the ground level figuring out these budgets right now um while we're in sacramento trying to tell the legislature you got to do more you got to do more you got to look at more revenue and so that's the conundrum right now is is reopening safely when when we're when you know we're looking at potentially like flat funding being the best case scenario yeah thank you thank you thank you to the three of you again um also just making the point that even pre-covid we were not funded appropriately adequately i love the comment about it being a priority and as the fifth largest economy I, our students need to be our priority. So thank you all for uh, focusing us in that direction. So yes, now turning to our school district leaders. Um, Jose, you are responsible for almost 10,000 young scholars in East San Jose. Given the proposed reductions, how severe will the cuts be to Oak Grove? There we go. Uh, thank you. Had to unmute myself uh, for the invitation to participate in this uh, in this panel. Um, again, um, a lot of great points have been made, and and I want to uh, just uh, remind everybody of a, a a data point that was so compelling when I heard it, and I believe it was from School Services of California, which was that out of the last 31 years, there's only been seven years where the state met its fiscal obligations to local school districts and and so i think that in answering the question that you pose i think have to share some context uh to to my response and that is that in 2013 when lcff uh, was implemented we went from paying uh 4.8 million dollars in stirs and purse contribution so now we're paying close to $12 million in Sturson Purse contribution without any additional support or any additional funding to uh, account for that. Uh, second, that even with full restoration of LCFF, we have to remember that that gave us, gave us back the spending power back to 2000, 2008, 2007, 2008 funding levels. So those are really critical uh, factors um, if, for local school districts, particularly in high cost of living areas. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, um, with the economy surging in Bay Area and cost of living su at such a high uh, uh, impact, we've lost over 1,600 students from 2013 forward. Uh, that represents about $13 million, $14 million of lost revenue. Wow. When you add additional cost of about $8.5 million of additional stirs and purse contribution, and really the, also the pressures of helping our, our teachers and our staff live in this area, um, is, it's really a, a huge challenge to now have to come up with an additional $8 million of budget cuts for our particular school district. And, and we've been, cutting, we've cut over $8 million, about $8.1 million from 2014 forward already. We've closed two schools. We've reduced seven district level administrators and two site principals. Um, coming up with, there's really um, not much left to cut, mm. except for what hurts the most, and that is program services and the people directly providing that level of service to our kids. Mm -hmm. And so being forced as a, a school leader, as an educator, to make decisions um, about, uh, especially in this pandemic, of laying people off and, mm -hmm. and, and impacting uh, student services um, is, is just, it's devastating. Um, having to implement that for our school district, it would devastate our district. I, I don't know how uh, we could come up with sufficient cuts to, uh, to make that work. Yeah, point well taken. So Bob, high school is the last oasis before launching into adulthood. 
Given the proposed reductions, how severe will the cuts be on your district? Well, I'm feeling kind of bad right now <laughs> because you talked about the disparity amongst districts in the funding model. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, Campbell Union High School District, we, were, we basically served the west side of San Jose. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, you know, this is what, this is what east side gets per student. Well, we get about $2,000 more, $3,000 more, somewhere in between there per student. And uh, sadly, you can put a map out and you can just take that map and just go north from us. And then it gets more and more and more. So, you know, uh, Cupertino, those kids, it's a little bit higher spend. You get to Palo Alto, it's an even higher spend. You get to Mountain View, higher spend. And so uh, I can say that, uh, you know, uh, keep the faith, Jose. Uh, I'm an Oak Grove alum. I got two nieces going to your schools. Uh, but even still, we would have to make some reductions. Uh, probably not to the extent that Jose would have to. Sadly, I think most of those reductions, if they had to happen, would come from our support staff. Mm. <laughs> and so, and those are really the people that more than anybody are making things run right now. So the, you know, the same staff that are making, uh, providing food service during this time, feeding families, et cetera, um, they could be the ones potentially in most danger right now. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, if I was a betting woman, and I hear Las Vegas is now open, so perhaps a, a little jaunt, but if I was a betting woman, I would bet that all of you have been in discussion about distance learning in the last 24 hours. Wes, I know the Association of California School Administrators has been holding many informational meetings, forums, town halls about distance learning. So what impact does the state budget have on distance learning if it becomes necessary for next school year? Yeah, Lisa, great, great bet. And if you're heading to Vegas, let me know. I'm gonna meet up and yeah. give you a bag of pennies. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, you know, not, not to be quick, but the, the budget reductions force distance learning. So mm -hmm. that, that's what it's going to do. Superintendents and labor leaders all across the state have said the same thing, which is if the May revise is the adopted budget, we will only open virtually in California. Um, and so that's the short answer. But, but I think, you know, digging into some of the details, ACSA put out um, guidelines for reopening schools. Um, and within that, we have a call to action and essential commitments, as well as modalities and considerations. But, but within the, the call to action, we said we have to define minimum standards for high quality distance learning. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just enough to get in front of a computer or to get a packet to fill it out. Downloading information from the internet is not high quality education. And so to do high quality education, to have daily interaction with students, we're gonna to have to invest in the resources to do it. Um, the state's trying to help with devices. The first partner is leading an effort there. We're working with USC on a broadband solution to provide broadband to every single household in California. But even then you've got to do professional development. I mean, I, I'm thinking about uh, my dad who taught for 44 years. Uh, you're going to give him a computer and say, now do online learning. It's unfair. Um, we're going to have to do professional development so people know how to provide in a distance format, high quality instruction and intervention. And, and that comes at a cost. Um, the, the nature of, of online learning also means that if we do a hybrid and then have to um, also do this, now, now we're, we're doing double instruction. And as Toby has pointed out on panels with me before, we're going to be asking teachers to teach more, not fewer hours. We've got to negotiate that. People have got to be compensated for that extra time. And so there are so many elements to this that are going to increase the cost. For people to think that distance learning is going to be cheap is not true. Mm -hmm. it, it will be necessary, but it will not be cheap. And, and I'd also add this, um, and, and you're going to, you're going to, 
elbow me and next time I see you because I, I answer questions you didn't ask and I apologize. But no, that's fine. Dear friend, I hope you give me grace. Of course. Uh, as, as we think about distance learning, we have to be thinking too about distance learning for our neediest students. Mm -hmm. So how do we provide for our special education students, special needs students? But let me also say this. John Singleton has this movie, Higher Education, and the theme of the education is that racism is a learned behavior. And he suggests in the movie that education could be the vaccination for racism if we took that on. And I think a lot of people are going to be coming back to the school year talking about what everyone in this world is talking about right now, mm -hmm. racial injustice and racism um, specifically. A and to to enter into that is going to cost resources. Oh, yeah. We need to invest in helping students unlearn what society has taught them about race. So there's another expense. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, you can always bring that into the conversation when you're with me, <laughs> absolutely. So um, Jose, impact on distance learning on the budget for you for next year, what are you, what are you all calculating over there in Oak Grove? to unmute. There we go. I'll yeah. get it. I'll get it one of these times. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we, we conducted a survey um, with our community parents and, and students and, um, and one of the uh, surprising, um, well, I guess not surprising, but it certainly uh, highlighted the need of the inequities in, in our district was uh, the access to reliable internet uh, within our different parts of our community. And um, really in, in even areas where we didn't expect that there uh, was a lack of access to uh, mm -hmm. the internet. Um, and so for us, just to implement distance learning in a way that uh, at least allows a device for every student and access uh, to, uh, to uh, go online for every student, we're talking about 3,500 3, devices. Wow. So it's about, uh, about $1.2, $1.3 million. That's just for the device. Now, um, we have about close to about 500 families that said they didn't have any internet service at all. And so, um, and we suspect that that number uh, so long as the economy doesn't turn back around and people go back to work, uh, that that number potentially goes even higher. And so just for a monthly service at $40 per unit for internet access, we're again now talking about $350,000 to $400,000 uh, to just provide that access. So again, going back to West's point, it's going to cost us uh, more money, not just one-time investment, but ongoing investment if there isn't an, an ongoing solution that is, um, that is uniform for all of our students throughout the state in terms of access to reliable internet to be able to participate in quality distance learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, true. Bob, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would just add that, you know, when we talk about quality distance learning, a lot of discussion that we've had in our district has been around um, what's the right approach in terms of asynchronous versus synchronous mm -hmm. learning, right. right? So how much of that is happening real time where the student and the teacher are in the same piece of cyberspace together and, and how much of it is asynchronous where the teacher's not necessarily with the student at the time and Again, if, if we don't have childcare available to right. teachers, they, they're gonna, they can only do so much when it comes to synchronous learning uh, mm -hmm. because they're gonna have, and it happens already, it happens to me where you know, my son goes walking past me sometimes you know, in, in the background. And so um, definitely it comes back, I think, to the theme of priorities. Is mm -hmm. that you know, what, what are our priorities and and if we can't do everything, what are we going to do? Right, right, great, thank you. So um, in my opening, oh, I just wanted to remind the audience, if you have any questions that you would like to ask the panel to please put those in the chat box. Um, staff will be looking there. And then at the end of the panel discussion, we will be um, having the panel address some of the questions that we've received in the chat box. So make sure you get those in. 
All right, so in my opening, I pointed to the inequities in California's current funding model. The result of these inequities for students who have special needs, students who are behind in grade level, or do not have access and opportunities to succeed, this, these can be life altering. So Toby, from the teacher perspective, could you comment on the impact of the budget on students who have special needs or are behind in grade level, including perhaps some demographic differences? Well, uh, first off, nothing replaces having a child in this, and a teacher in front of each other in the physical space. Mm -hmm. So Great. this virtual reality has required us to not only depend on the educator on the other side of the screen and that child, but also the families behind that screen that's not visible. Mm -hmm. So as much as we try to be as effective in giving our special needs students and our students that are, are as you say, behind in their learning abilities, the opportunities, we are also depending on the family to help us do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're frightened. Yeah. Because we are going to be, and it's not just the educators, it's the districts and, and such, they're going to be held accountable for that special needs child's IEPs to be implemented. Mm -hmm. So how do, we, how do we navigate that without having the necessary funding? And if we continue in this virtual world, are we going to make sure that the educator and the student is not um, COVID positive mm -hmm. and not have the necessary PPE and you know the the spacing and all that that wouldn't be necessary for them to get their occupational therapy maybe it's some type of physical therapy that they need you know vocational you name it mm -hmm. so it's yeah. all about again you know you know i think that's going to be the the word that's going to weave through everything that we say priority mm -hmm. what is our priority in order to teach and educate our students the way they need to be taught I know my educators are ready and willing to do so in a safe manner, but what does that look like? Have we truly vetted all the possibilities? Mm -hmm. That's where we have to go to. Um, demographics, we know, and this is, this is no secrets, our lower socioeconomic folk, our black and brown children are behind in a lot of areas. And how do we infuse that into them in a distance world? It's not gonna be easy, but it is possible. And we have to make sure that, again, we look at all the possible opportunities in order to give them what our students need. And it's, it can't just be the FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And again, it can't be just a one-sided educator and student, it has to include the whole family. So how do we wrap that service and those opportunities around to let our parents know that this is part of their responsibility, especially in this shelter in place that's slowly being retracted, but in a lot of places still there because all the numbers are starting to increase again. Right, right. So we have a lot of work. I'm optimistic because I know I'm looking at these people on this panel <laughs> that I, I know that they're ready to work. It's just that we have to get the government across the street from where I am to understand that and make us a priority and not have us continue to go through this process of, of piecemealing an opportunity that we have to truly, professional development is important, but educating our parents are going to be just as important because they need the skills too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Dennis, how are school boards dealing with this issue? Um, it's not it's not easy and it's not fun uh, because of the resources so you know the concerns that you're hearing from the superintendents and then from toby um are all being you know grappled with school board members as well because the issues is the issues are how do we re, how do we reopen safely so uh wes talked about axa has a reopening document we just released ours last night so you know go to the axa website go to the cspa website the department of public health has issued guidance as has uh, state superintendent so you know you can go through those and read 
and read the documents very quickly. Although, you know, I think, you know, some of them are like 50 pages long, but there's a theme there. And it really is about how to reopen safely. Mm -hmm. um, and so what school boards are looking at is how do we do that, meet the needs of the students, all the students with all their various needs. Um, they know that reopening schools is key to reopening the economy. It's all those things in a world where there's not enough money. And that, that to me is, is the stress point for us as advocates and representing you know, elected school board leaders is how do, you, how do you match the two? Here's the expectations, here's what's needed, and then here's kind of the funding level in there. And that's when it comes to much is we're doing the best we can to try to figure that out here in Sacramento, but also in Washington, D.C., because that's a key, a key input as well. Mm -hmm. But how it reaches the local level and the stress points. I was having, I was texting with a labor leader, not Toby, just before this saying, hey, did you know that school districts right now are budgeting for the May revision level, which is the 10% cut? And I, I texted back. Well, they have to right now because that's the lowest common denominator. When the legislature votes on the budget on Monday, that will change how they start planning for their budgets to be adopted then the next following weeks. And we're just, we're just praying right now that they adopt the higher levels so that we're not looking at all these costs and a 10% cut world. We're looking at all these costs, which is at least at a workload budget. And then we all have to focus our, our efforts on Congress to provide another round of stimulus to where we can actually then pay for and 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 do the things that we need to do with perhaps the four to five hundred dollars more per student that this is going to actually cost us to reopen schools. So, I mean, that's that's the stuff that's keeping a lot of folks awake at night, and those are conversations we're having with 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 our members. At the same time, you know, who wants to do? Who can't? Talking about layoffs in this kind of a scenario yeah. when every yeah. every classified employee is going to be needed, every teacher is going to be needed, every principal is going to be needed. How do you manage layoffs in a COVID-19 world? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, answer, I'm asking more questions. I'm not answering anything because that's the stress that I think is going on locally and it's going on through all the school districts throughout the state. It's a labor stress. It's a leadership stress through administrators classified stress and it's a school board stress and it should be a community stress too. those of you who are on this who are community leaders business leaders y'all I mean we all should be in this together pressing our le our elected leaders that we need the resources to actually do this correctly great thank you and and I appreciate you sharing the kinds of questions that are going through school board members heads because that is that gives us another level of understanding like this you know down to it when we're sitting at the table this is what we're thinking about so um, appreciate that so um i would not it, it would be remiss of me uh, in my action orientation to have us not talk about uh, magic wands and solutions because i get up every morning thinking that i can and will make a difference and uh, go forward and try to remove obstacles. So I'm giving you that opportunity now. Um, I know that most of us have thought, if the governor and state legislature would only, what? What, if they would, that one thing, if they would only, what? Um, now you have the opportunity to share your wisdom with, about that, okay? So Bob, we'll start with you. What one change to the current education funding model do you think would have the biggest impact? Okay, well, I don't have any wisdom to share, so you're just gonna have to get the part that I have. Okay. Uh, and this is, and this, I'm gonna say something that does not go to my own self-interest, and so I apologize right now, high school superintendents, <laughs> but, you know, I think about this issue of priorities, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like, Unfortunately, people aren't being, like the, the people of our state, our, our neighbors, they're not really, the, the picture is not being painted for them about what should we do, this or this. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, I think that the younger the student, the more vital it is that they get back to school. Yeah. I think that there is more, more uh, of a reasonable expectation that a high school senior can perhaps do
do distance learning than a kindergartner can. And so it doesn't go, wouldn't help my district, but frankly, <laughs> if, 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 uh, if state leadership said, you know what, high school grades, we're gonna de-emphasize you right now because we need to send more to, to kindergarten, first grade. Um, I would support that 100%. Nice. Right, and then who shows up on your door a few years later is actually going to be a better situation for you. So you would reap those benefits later on, yeah. Jose, what, what do you think? What's, what's your, uh, what's your uh, magic wand wisdom? Uh, I would go back to what Wes mentioned early on um, when we started the, uh, the session, and that is um, increasing the base. I think in ensuring that uh, the uh, fifth largest economy in the world invests and as Toby also mentioned, highlighted various times, to prioritize our kids um, by being uh, in the top quintile in the nation in pupil funding. We have one of the most diverse um, uh, student population in, in, in our nation. And um, that also, uh, is a complex system to try to implement in terms of how we educate and what kind of professional development that we have to have um, and how to create an impact in what was mentioned earlier before around eliminating racism and uh, supporting all students uh, in our classrooms. Um, and I think it has to start with uh, the level of priority that uh, highlights students first uh, with uh, the appropriate funding to do so. Um, and, you know, absent that, outside of that, it's also exploring at this point, also providing school districts the, uh, the type of flexibility that we need to survive through this uh, difficult time. And, um, you know, I, I wish also the state had a magic wand to, uh, to uh, do a lot of other things, but, uh, at minimum, support school districts to get through this by uh, providing as much flexibility as possible. But uh, going back to the funding question, uh, it has to start with a priority and, and creating a, an adequate base that uh, takes us uh, uh, to the appropriate levels. Thank you, thank you. Wes? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll ditto Jose, well, well said at a, at a macro level, you know, California should be in the top five in per people spending. Um, I think we have to have honest, tough conversations. Someone said this um, at the beginning. Um, we lead the world in prison funding, in incarceration funding, and we're one of the worst in education funding. So let's think about who we're incarcerating and for what and for how long. Mm -hmm. I think there's some easy answers there. Um, there are some other things that are even more doable than that right now, we have the Schools and Community First Initiative that bring, bring about three to five billion dollars into public education on an ongoing basis. Uh, I've talked to Joe Boyd at CTO, we've had good conversations, and, and I think we both believe this has to be a multi-year attempt. Mm -hmm. um, you'll probably remember that CSBA and AXA had a full and fair funding initiative that would have brought 13 to yeah. 15 billion dollars in an ongoing basis into public education uh, and it was polling really really high um, and so if if all we can do is a two-year approach to that then let's be all in on that let's have right. two years of initiatives that put 18 billion dollars in the system or and here's a novel idea and we pushed for this as well we could have the governor and the legislature come together and and by two-thirds vote put these on to a ballot and support yep. and save us money and having to run campaigns uh, again, if this is a priority, there are answers out there. Let's mm -hmm. not pretend like there aren't um, and, and see where it goes. But yeah. ditto to Jose mostly. Great, great. Okay, Toby, what are your thoughts? Oh, uh, Wes, I owe you coffee, buddy. That's all <laughs> I have to say. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with what Jose and Wes has stated. Bob, I'm not leaving you out because you know I have to look at the totality of the whole state. If I, if I could wave my magic wand, that's a great question. Because the first thing I would do is make sure that everyone understood that 
what we have in Prop 98 is just the base that should never be looked at as the ceiling, that we need to have a dedicated mm -hmm. funding source for education that may be you know, hit like anything else, but it's dedicated, that is fully funding education in the manner in which it should be funded, that we, won't, we wouldn't have to look for any outside entities or anything else. We have the resources here, folks. It's again, what do we do as a priority? for education and that's that's the number one question but full funding dedicated funding source so we wouldn't have to go to the ballot every two years in order to say hey you know we need some money folks in order to make sure that we are educating the future of the state and this world that shouldn't be the case we should never look at education in those eyes and in that sense education should be the priority of the state yeah. To our society we have the opportunity to educate and eradicate the racism that's in our system we have the, to eliminate the poverty that's in our system if we educate our people they become better citizens which become more aware which then in turn will fight all these inequities that we are currently seeing mm -hmm. that's what my magic wand would do Great, great. All right, Dennis, you're gonna bring us home here. Wow. <laughs> again, well, again, it's one of those things where I could say ditto, but you know, just a couple of other facts. Because you know, on the line here, if it's all educators, you know, we can all say, oh yeah, more resources. But I know there's business leaders, you know, so I know there's, it's a mixture here. And so, you know, to hear educators just continually talk about resources, some people may be turned off about that. But here's the thing: is that you know, Wes said we're the fifth largest economy in the world. That's great, but focus a little bit more on the U.S. We are the number one economy in the United States, and that's where we compete mostly. Yes, we're a global economy, but we're talking about per pupil funding from the state that is the leader in in technology. We're the we we got the biggest economy, um, but we're funding schools at about 38th right now. I think the latest was, I think we bumped up to 36, but I think with this last year's budget, we're back down to 38. In per pupil funding, and that's in the wealthiest, biggest economy in the country. There's a problem. So yeah, my dream would be resources and, and getting us up into the top 10 uh, nationally, because then we would have the resources to do what we need to do, the things that Toby was talking about, the thing that the superintendents are talking about, uh, to get those services to actually close achievement gaps. I mean, the thing is, is during the last few years, all students have been learning and, you know, scores and, and, and stuff's been going up, but everybody's been kind of going at the same rate. So we're not able to close gaps. We need resources to make sure that we close the gaps so that our entire population is learning right there at the level we need for our economy to stay productive. So for me, it's resources. And that's why we are so, so zeroed in on resources because they are absolutely the key to get us to where we need to be. And then you drop in this COVID-19 crisis and it further exposes the problems that we're having with our, our, our per people funding. So for us, it's, it's you know everything everybody's been talking about, and, but the bottom line is we need to invest um, you know, invest to reopen schools because reopening schools is reopening the economy. But investing in children as a priority means that our economy will stay number one, keep producing jobs that pay well so that people in the Bay Area, people in Silicon Valley can afford to live there um, and, and be productive and successful. That's the key. And that's kind of the bottom line of what we want to do. But it, that's it's always going to be resources and it's going to be unapologetic until we get to the place where we need to be. Great. Thank you. Well, a heartfelt thank you to all of our practitioners, though you are not finished. Um, your perspective assists us all in doing our part to move the agenda forward for full equitable K-12 funding. So thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome back Denise Williams, SVS Chiefs Programs Officer, to ask some of the questions from our viewers. Denise. Thank you, Lisa. 
And thanks again to the panelists. That was pretty amazing. We do have some questions, not as many as I thought. So that means that you guys did such a phenomenal job <clears throat> in getting all of the significant uh, information out to the listeners. So uh, let's get started. And um, this first question, and most of them are not for any particular person. So just unmute when you are ready to um, answer. So this first one, in 2009, and the Great Recession, the school year was reduced from 180 to 175 days. Is cutting school days being considered? I'm not sure, to be honest with you, but I do know that, again, um, it's above my pay raise. Um, because the legislators across the street they have to think outside the box. My only concern is that when sometimes they think outside the box, it affects and impacts the members that I represent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you go about doing that creative thinking that's needed in order to make sure that schools have what they need to open safely and we can continue on with our educational process? It's going to look different, I know but we need the resources to even begin to contemplate that. That's gonna require them to think outside the box. So that's probably gonna be in the mix. I'm, I, I don't know. However, whatever happens should occur without impacting my members. And I'm sure that that will go for any of the other union folk that are out there and the school boards and superintendents, they understand the importance of it. It's all about making sure we have what we need. And if that's gonna be in the mix, unfortunately, those things all have to be negotiated, which I'm sure everyone understands the process. And it's gonna be a really tough sell. Mm -hmm. It will be tough. All right. You know, if I can add too, so yeah, as Toby said, yes, it's one of about 50 things that have been suggested or talked about on the issue of flexibility. Um, but that's kind of a budgeting issue on reopening length of the school year is not as important as daily minutes mm -hmm. and and the minutes that are required under the education code um, because of like let's say if you want to do some sort of a hybrid where there's classroom time distance learning how do you how do you meet your minutes requirements mm -hmm. uh, the other flexibilities that are being talked about is holding districts harmless because there's an expectation that some districts are just going to lose students if they come back without any distance learning or are parents going to be confident but yeah it's in the mix as toby said you got to negotiate it because when you talk about a shorter school year the term that comes along with that is then furlough days you know we can shorten the school year but really when people are talking about 175 days they're talking about then ha that can't be furlough days and that's where it comes into affecting and impacting toby's members so there's a lot of flexibility issues that are on the table right now. And, and this one is in the mix, whether it rises to the top or not, um, we're not sure, but it really comes down to is how, do, how can we offer a quality system in this environment safely? I mean, those are the questions. And if this rises to the top as being the number one thing, mm -hmm. it's got a better chance, but if not, you know, it will fall to the wayside on other issues, but it's, it's there for now. Lisa, can I, can I uh, jump in on this as well? Because I, I put a comment into the chat box, and I think this speaks to one of the core values of SVEF. You know, when we shorten the instructional minutes, we reduce the in instructional minutes, we, we shorten the school year, that's less quality instruction. Mm -hmm. And as Toby said a minute ago, there's nothing more important than that time those students have with that teacher engaged in high quality instruction. And so when we're looking at a world and a state that needs more, education than less mm -hmm. where we have persistent historically persistent gaps um even if we can do that to balance the budgets is that okay right is that okay for our students um and so if, if we're a student centric state and and profession then i think we while that may be in play we've got to figure out something else to bring into play because mm -hmm. i i would argue our students need more not less Mm -hmm. of that high quality instruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are there any creative or unique corporate partnerships in plans of helping us fill the gap many of the schools are facing 
in terms of tech, Wi-Fi, conductivity, conductivity. Well, I had mentioned earlier that there, there are several big things going on. The SPI with the first partner, they're doing an initiative, hundreds of thousands of devices, and hundreds of thousands of uh, hotspots. This continues to be a priority in the governor's horseshoe as well as his home. So I, there's, there's some play there. Um, I mentioned that USC with AXA, we're looking at um, hosting a, a broadband summit in July where we look at some of the legislation and Dennis answered a question about um, that legislation that's being discussed there. Um, but but to, to really work with the governor to put pressure on um, those providers uh, to, to do more really even than just low cost. Um, anyway, so there, there are quite a few multi-agency efforts out there right now and it goes as high as um, the governor's office and his home. Just a quick piggy bank uh, on, on Wes. Uh, just at a local level, I know that uh, uh, the Eastside High School District along with uh, Eastside Alliance District, um, uh, Eastside started a partnership with the city of San Jose through um, the funding of um, a community-based uh, internet and that would provide uh, free internet for um, all of the students in Eastside. And so we're currently uh, trying to uh, create that partnership that would be able to serve all of our uh, feeder schools, elementary schools that feed in, in, into the high school district. Um, and that would uh, potentially be able to provide uh, internet access within uh, our local area, which again, uh, highlights local and local resourcing as opposed to a state level solution that, that we all need. And, and so, uh, but uh, just at a local level, I know that that's uh, still also a challenge to resource that, to get that all uh, up and running and, and serving students and, and community. If, if I could just put a, a plug, I, I get to sit in this very unique position of um, being a support and being an advocate. And um, it, it really is disheartening when I see my colleagues who are in charge of educating the future also having to be responsible for making sure people have internet. Um, this is, uh, again, I fear something that communities and uh, politicians put onto the school system to solve. And having a, a household connected is, is yes about the student being able to be educated, but it's about the family being able to have access to information, which we know equates to economic mobility. So I encourage everyone who is on this call to not uh, solely look to your school district or your teacher or your principal or your superintendent to provide hotspots, internet uh, to the community. That is, that is something that needs to be solved um, by, by others. Um, it's now as, as when a child doesn't have glasses, when a child doesn't have a breakfast, when a child doesn't have clothing, they end up at school and that then becomes a school issue to solve. And all of those things um, are take time, these instructional minutes, these instructional days, when you're also providing and having to solve for all these other pieces, you're not getting at what we are trained to do, which is educate the future. So um, I'm gonna put in a, maybe not a very popular plug, but let's let our educators educate. Let's let our teachers teach. Let's let our principals lead schools. Let's let our superintendents lead the educational process and the rest in the community step up and do what you're here to do which is to provide all these other services. Um, I think this question is in a lot of, of uh, especially our families' minds. And it says, doesn't the experience in Korea trying to reopen schools make it seem impossible that we in the United States could open schools safely until there is a vaccine? And if COVID-19 cases continue to increase as the state reopens, should opening schools be even considered? No, 
no one's leaping to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think Toby and Bob, you know, like, what, you, what does Toby and Bob have to say about that? Uh, I'll, I'll say this. Um, it, it certainly is a wake up call. Um, and, and what we've been saying all along at AXA is that these decisions have to be based on science and experts in public health and not politicians, right? So these decisions shouldn't be politicized. I'll also say we live in a very, very diverse state. Um, for those of you that have never been out of Silicon Valley, not all places look like that. Um, not all places have high rise buildings, public transportation, uh, major sports, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are places all over the state, very, very small rural communities where they had zero incidents. And, and so I think counties and public health agencies in those places would look at that Korea data and say, it doesn't represent us. So it's not a data point that we're going to use. Um, and so as a state, I think, yes, it's eye-opening. And I think it also demonstrates what, what, and I don't want to misquote you, Toby, but what you said kind of at the beginning is like, if we're going to keep people safe, we're not opening statewide in large scale. We're just not. But are there places around the state that absolutely will? Um, in fact, they have. They started to bring students in for summer programs. And so things like that are happening. They will happen. And I think we have to learn from the best science and the best research uh, and best safety guidelines on this subject. Um, I have to agree. We have 58 counties who have 58 various health departments that will determine the feasibility of the schools opening in those areas. Now that's only if they have the necessary PPE and the distancing and everything else that's required according to the guidelines that are being sent out. So unless we can actually guarantee that the safety of the student, educator, and that community is going to be upheld and the top priority, I can't see it happening. And that's the question again, it's gonna take resources. And do you really, do we really have the resources in order to make that occur? And, and if it does open and say it's a hybrid, what happens to those families? And I mentioned it before we started, that are less fortunate than a lot of us. They will not be able to get back into the economy in order to work because face it folks, child care is the number one, school system is the number one child care for a lot of our working class families. And we don't even have the number of child care centers opening back up because of the COVID-19. So when we look at this and we look at the various um, counties, school districts, we have a thousand, over a thousand school districts. All those has to be considered before we say, okay, yes, we're gonna open up. You know, Korea can do it because it's a different, very different um, governmental structure. And we're just not like that. And so we, I, it's like apples and oranges to me. And I'll jump, I'll just jump in because I got called out. So, you know, here in Santa, in Santa Clara County, I feel very privileged that we have had very good county leadership, both from our health officer and from the county superintendent of schools and coordinating uh, the districts together and, and, uh, and being in constant collaboration with the public health officer. So I think that that, that has built up, at least in, from, from me, a lot of trust that uh, when, if Dr. Cody says you could do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna believe her. So um, there are a couple more questions. I did get a comment in the chat that um, everyone knows Dr. Dewan is on the call and they might not have heard that she was going to be doing the culminating um, responses at the end, but some of the folk are really interested in hearing what she has to say. So if any of these questions, uh, Dr. Dewan, that you want to speak to at this time, feel free to jump in. Um, they really, you know, are really eager at hearing what you have to say in a lot of, a lot of these uh, questions and comments. So I'm not saying you have to, but, and you have your little space for your commenting at the end, but 
I don't want to tell you, you can't say anything at this time. So just want you to know that they're really eager to hear you. Um, so whenever you want to jump in, just go ahead on it. So there's this question here. Um, and we did mention this earlier a little bit, but maybe we can go in with a little bit more detail. So how do we provide distance learning for our neediest students who may live in a home where they do not have adequate parent, parental support? And of course, how can we support and educate parents and families when they are too, they also are so strapped? Well, that's the million dollar question mm -hmm. because we have to, again, nothing replaces the student in the, in the educator in the classroom. And so that's where we're the most effective in making sure that the needs of our most neediest students are met. That's also the time and place where we can actually bring in the parent and give them that guidance and the education or possible solutions and giving them tools in order to help that student. Mm -hmm. Unless we have that parent with that child during that screen time, that's going to be almost uh, an impossible task because again, we don't know who's behind the screen helping that child as they navigate this virtual world. We can offer you know, um, sessions that are just dedicated to parents. Since they have the device at home, maybe we start offering workshops for them during the times that their child is not on. M maybe we start giving them more literature that they can read. And again, you're, you're making assumptions that they are able to do so. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out where the child and the parent and the family is and then move them forward from there. But nothing replaces that in-person um, opportunity to educate that child and then the extended to the family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, I'd like to do a, a shout out to an effort that um, SVF has just become involved with and found out about, and that's the work of the California Emerging Technology Fund, their school to home initiative. And um, in the school to home initiative, uh, it's a middle school team works with a, a coach, a school to home coach. Devices are provided to students. Connectivity is provided to families. Professional development is provided to teachers so that they um, can begin to understand the powers of ed tech, how to appropriately use ed tech. And digital literacy sessions are provided to the families. So now you have a continuum of training a continuum of support, and you have the actual stuff to get it done. And it's a two to three year initiative of um, getting this moving um, throughout a school, knowing that outside resources are still going to need to be able to replenish these devices and replenish the, um, the connectivity. So I would encourage folks to look um, to the school to home uh, SVF is uh, a partner in that. So if you're on the call and that sounds like something you'd like for your uh, school or your district to be involved in, please contact us. But that was a, an effort of, of all the entities coming together to have a solution set long term for this, uh, for this type of learning to occur. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a couple more. Um, so are there any champions for education? We know that there are in the state legislature that can drive conversations and influence budget decisions. And along with that is understanding the power of the recent protests. Is there anything our community can do to support legislatures to fight for education? I can I can take that because um, you know I'm kind of I'm just I'm looking around Santa Clara County and uh, Silicon Valley and the legislators you all have both in Congress and in the state um, 
they're all very attuned right now to this very issue. Um, so yes, on uh, the issues that we've been talking about, including funding, um, but also like the on the equity issues, things like that, I, your entire delegation, state and federal, I, I, are, are leaders on this issue. So keep the chatter going because here's the thing is, is we were talking from March and April with legislators about what funding was needed at that moment and then with a with an eye toward the future the may revision comes out the legislature immediately adopted higher numbers so they're listening and that's why i'm thinking we just need to keep the talk going and and it's you know there's patrick o'donnell from long beach who's the chair of assembly education yeah he'll listen to you but you know focusing on your delegation and the reason why I mentioned federal is because that next round of stimulus is critical and your delegation is there as well. So I just think if we're all together in this pressuring and pushing, um, they're going to have that, they're going to have our voices behind them then to really push for the, the resources and to protect the resources um, and all these other issues, just even also just on the, on the equity issues on, um, and, you know, the things like that are, are just so critical. So, yeah, I mean, we just need to keep pressing. Don't get weary. Keep pressing. Once this budget is done at the state level, start focusing on Washington, D.C. for that next level of, of stimulus. But, you know, your delegation and this, the whole Bay Area is very attuned to this. And um, there's some areas of the state where we say you got to beat you got to beat your legislators up. Right now, it's Let's get behind the Bay Area legislators uh, because they are they're singing the same tune and they know how important schools are. So just you know, we just have to keep up the work. It's it's gonna be several months if you talk it through the federal legislation as well, and we just can't get tired. We have to not drop the ball on this one. Mm -hmm. You know, the strange thing thing is is that um most of the legislator on in the assembly side have not gone through a recession or such like this. We have that we have students that have gone through the 2008-2009 debacle with the you know recession and everything because and they were and they felt it. Now you look at the upper house, the Senate, there are people there that was actually in office in 2008 and they understand the urgency. So like Dennis stated, it's not, I look at it as, as a nonpartisan situation, at least that's how education should be regardless, but I know I'm living in my own fantasy world. So if we all just start calling and making sure that we reach out to those people that we know throughout the state and have them call, as Dennis stated, the Capitol first, the state Capitol, and then let's concentrate on them to make sure that they get the budget out and get it passed and get it approved in the manner that's going to hold us harmless. That's our first step. Our federal level is a different story because we, you know, our champions there are two states uh, senators. I mean, they're there and they are on board with us. It's convincing the people across the rest of the nation to vote for the stimulus. Currently, we're earmarked for about $65 billion in education by itself. We need almost three times that amount in order to truly have an impact that will help us. It's not going to solve everything, it's going to help us. And that's what we, we just need time. Because I'm hoping that by giving us that time, the state legislature will, then I, I can't say what I wanna say, but, mm -hmm. Uh, have the foresight to do what Wes stated. They can put something on the ballot in order to make sure that we have the funding and the increase in revenues that we need in the state. So we need time right now. And the only way that we're going to get is if we get that influx of cash or that, that support that's needed, not only from the state, but from the federal. And if you like, I, you know, I have this number memorized in my mind because I tell my members to call it always when I get the opportunity. And if, if there's no objection, I'm looking at you, Lisa. 
I one eight five five nine seven seven one seven seven zero. You can get in contact with your your state folks, and they will let you know. You can leave your message and tell them the importance of making sure that they get this budget right for education. Can you put type that into the chat as well? I sure will. Thank Thanks. you. Yes. Hey, Denise, as, as you read these questions, this isn't really a question, but it, it's something I've seen. If, if you don't mind, can I just comment on um, how amazed I am and inspired by parents and caregivers and, and how they have stepped up and the time they've spent um, on behalf of my wife that's in front of me every day. She keeps mm -hmm. asking me, when the heck are you going to have this stuff figured out so that our son can get back to school? Um, and in real terms, it's had uh, an, in, an impact on the social, emotional wellness of adults, and it certainly has on our students. Uh, for that reason, we need to invest in public education so students can get back to, to school. And parents need to get back to work. I think Barbara mentioned it in the comments that, you know, they're going to have to give up part of their salary. Well, that's going to hurt economic recovery. It's going to hurt their social, emotional wellness when they're trying to do the same or more with less. As adults, we know the stress of that. And it's more stressful for some of our folks and others, and we know that also. So there's another reason. Um, and, and, and to get to Pedro's comment, if, if we look at other countries and it's not working, then what types of investments do we need here to change those data points? And whatever that takes, let's get there. And I think that's the purpose of this call and, and it addresses some of those other groups that maybe we haven't had questions about. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that because I'm gonna take that uh, response and kind of wrap up that portion of it because our time is uh, chipping away here. And I know um, we are waiting to hear from our distinguished Dr. Mary Ann Dewan, County Superintendent of Schools as she brings closure to this amazing opportunity that we've been able to participate in. And just before she begins, um, she has had over 27 years of experience in pre-K through 12th education. She is the Deputy Superintendent at Santa Clara County Office of Education and recognized for her expertise and experience in early learning, special education, education reform, and change leadership. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dewan. Thank you um, so much, Denise. It's really great um, to be with all of you today. And I want to thank you all uh, for the invitation. Um, really, as your county superintendent of schools, I see my role in, is to advocate, to support, and promote the outstanding work that our leaders do. And, and we're really here um, as a collaborative partner um, and to try to, to bridge the gap on some of those things that um, are very difficult to do individually, but we have the power to do collectively. Um, this morning, I wanted to um, highlight a couple of thoughts and reflection as we listen to this distinguished panel today. Um, I want to begin with digital divide and just to really emphasize that this is a complex and costly endeavor, um, multifaceted um, components that need to be there. And I completely agree that it should not be solved on the backs of individual school districts. I do think there are pieces of this work that we can do uh, collectively as county offices and school districts, but the lion's share of this work really needs to be done by other entities and other groups, cities and counties, investments in infrastructure, statewide investments, um, and just our mindset around the internet. Um, is the internet really um, a luxury or is it essential to how we live and operate on a daily basis. Just as we would not tolerate young children, um, families living in homes without water or electricity, why do we tolerate them being able to live in homes without internet when they need to access healthcare, um, mental health supports, sign up to get a COVID-19 test, find meals, apply for a job, interview for a job, um, and do their distance learning. So it is not a school's problem, it is a community program, uh, community problem that must be solved collectively. 
I also want to um, just acknowledge that it has been a very hard fought bot battle just to get where we are today. When we think about the past 10 years, um, digging out of the Great Recession and to get to full funding. So these cuts that we're talking about um, are, are gonna be devastating. Um, so one of the um, things that we really should keep in mind is that the state does have a fiscal obligation. They're trying to manage this work in a time with declining enrollment and increased costs, but we must demand more and not less. We are so proud of and grateful to our teachers and classified staff who've really stepped up in this moment. Um, you've demonstrated exceptional resilience and flexibility by transitioning to distance learning mid-year with no notice. And our classified staff have kept uh, so many of our essential functions going as part of our COVID-19 response. We also recognize this has been costly and we cannot continue to do it without support and recognition at the state of the cost um, to do these types of services. We estimate that it could cost up to 40% more to operate schools while adhering to the health and safety orders that require social distancing, stable cohorts, heightened cleaning standards, PPE, and more. Plus it costs more to be able to, to move back and forth between an in-person offering and a distance learning offering at home. To ensure districts aren't competing for resources during this time and price gouging that might uh, enter into our work, the state needs to add schools to the existing procurement process and should ensure that schools also benefit from the $1.8 billion in federal CARES funds that were set aside for PPE and cleaning supplies for essential workers. And in order to serve all students where they are, schools are gonna to have to be more nimble and that requires flexibility. So some parents have indicated, for example, that no matter what, until there's a vaccine, they will not feel safe and secure sending their children back to school. We need to be ready and consider how will we support those families as well as our workers and employees who, who may have valid reasons and concerns about their inability to return. Mm -hmm. So we need this added flexibility and that flexibility comes with dollar signs. It costs money to do the types of things that we know are right to do that would promote equity in our community. Health and safety is our primary consideration. The well-being of, of our students and our staff have always been first and foremost in our thinking and in our planning. And that will continue to be central considerations as we work with our districts to consider opportunities for reopening and developing our reopening guidance. I think there are several calls to action that we should all um, come, come together on and collaborate on. The first is the message that it, it is a need for more money, not less. This is not a time to talk about cuts, cost more to operate. Secondly, um, schools need more flexibility. Um, the continuity of learning, the opportunity to utilize various funds to meet the priority needs of their communities. We also want schools to be able to sustain some of the key programs that they developed and reinvested in over the past 10 years, such as increased access to counselors and school nurses and other support services that are gonna be more important than ever as we consider the trauma that COVID-19 has brought upon our community. We also need to advocate on equitable distribution of these resources. Um, we know that certain groups of students need more, we know certain communities need more, and we need to fund for the needs of our communities. And lastly, we need to recognize that there is um, the increased cost around COVID-19 that are gonna be with us for a while the mental and emotional wellness supports, um, the cost of the daily operations, the training that our staff are gonna need, and just the ability to understand the impact of COVID on our average daily attendance and other um, factors that might influence our budget. So really um, continuing to tell the story of what we need locally. And I would also urge us all to tell the story of what we've been doing. Let our legislators know we have been good stewards of the dollars that have been provided to us. We have, we've stood up meals programs. We've provided 
uh, individualized supports. And we really want to ensure that our uh, legislators know that our teachers, um, our classified staff have really rallied at this time to support our, our children and their families. And telling those stories will help ensure that they understand the needs of our community and that they'll stand with us as they finalize their decisions around the budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for the opportunity to be with you today and thanks to the amazing leaders uh, who we had the pleasure to hear earlier. And thank you so much. Um, that does conclude our uh, event, our forum, but I firstly would like to thank you again, Dr. Dewan, and um, also to our panelists for the amazing job and just for all of you just taking the time to, to be a part of this uh, endeavor. I think that it was very worthwhile and that um, a lot of these questions that still may not be totally answered. It has given us an opportunity to push our thinking and push each other's thinking around this and to continue to have a venue to have these uh, conversations. And also thank you to Lisa Andrew for so graciously facilitating and to um, Manny Barbara, who was very uh, instrumental in um, getting all of our panelists and as we call him the godfather he's always there for us and he supports us and thank you so much for all that and also to our listeners another uh we couldn't do it without you we had to have some folks out there and we had to have people that would send in those meaningful questions so thank you so much for being a part of this and um please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions and i'm sure any of the panelists are also saying that too because i'm sure as you continue to go through your day, you'll think of things and say, oh, I should have asked that, but it's never too late, never too late. And there's a post survey that's probably popped up on your screen. So please take a second or two to just give us some feedback. We'd really appreciate that. And again, thank you for your uh, time and your uh, attention and please stay safe and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.